Thank you very much, dear participants to this webinar and listeners of the recording. Thank you on behalf of Nicholas and myself for taking the time and welcome you to a webinar on emerging markets, equity in COVID-19 times. As said, my name is Lodewijk van der Kroft. I'm a member of CFA Society uh, Netherlands and a managing director of Comges Benelux, the Comges client servicing organization based in Amsterdam. After my general introduction, my colleague Nicholas Moores uh, will walk you through uh, his presentation. Um, and um, uh, it's good to know that Nicholas Moores is an analyst and portfolio manager in our emerging markets team. Um, I'm trying to click on the slide as we speak. Somehow it doesn't work. So here we go. That's better. Um, sorry about that. Um, so Nicholas and myself will do the presentation today. After my uh, uh, general introduction, uh, Nicholas will take over. The presentation will be recorded by CFA. JBA Netherlands Society, as mentioned, in order to facilitate the process, it is unfortunately not possible to ask any questions during the presentation, but there will be ample opportunity afterwards. For those of you that are not familiar with Comgest, I would like to share uh, some general information. We are a fully owned um, firm by founders and employees. And we strive for long-term partnerships with our clients uh, and companies we hold in our portfolios. We only invest in listed equity and have about 33 billion in assets under management. Almost half that money is invested in emerging markets, the topic for today. Across all our strategies, we invest in a select number of companies that are able to grow their revenue and profits in a stable manner to varying degrees independent of the economic cycle an important element for today as well. These businesses need to have a competitive edge over their competition, and if valuations are attractive, they could end up in our concentrated high active share portfolios. On slide four, you see a snapshot of some of our longest running strategies. I think it is important to note that we don't invest in countries, uh, but in companies, and at Comgest, we are neither macro strategists nor epidemiologists, but given our coverage of companies across a great number of different emerging markets, we should be able to provide you with our bottom-up perspective on the ability of emerging markets companies to navigate the current complex environment. With that, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Nicholas, and I will ask the organization to hand over control of the slides to him. Thank you. Hi, could you, perfect, could we uh, hand over control, please? Share content. Good morning and thank you for joining us. So I'm going to talk to you about emerging markets, where they are now, how they're coping with COVID-19 and what we expect to happen in the future. But I think uh, let's look at a bit of history first uh, and uh, that'll give us some flavor as to how the future might develop. Um, here on uh, uh, slide eight, you can see how emerging markets have um, performed relative to uh, the developed world. Uh, and uh, there's a long history here from 1988 all the way to 22nd of May. Really, you had a, a great period in the 2000s, which was very much driven by commodities. But since 2011, emerging markets have, have disappointed despite their superior growth, both economically and in EPS terms. And we're going to explore in a, 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 a little bit later as to why why that may, might be the case. I would point out at this stage that there's been a dramatic change in the emerging market index during the time uh, during the last five six years compared to the 2000s, where where China now represents 40% of MSCI emerging, and tech, 
represents, well, te IT itself represents 17%, communication services 12%, and materials only 7%. So there's been a dramatic shift in terms of the structure of the index. And yet, despite that, and the fact that as China has increased its percentage of the index and therefore uh, the representation of emerging market growth would also have increased relative to DM. This is a, a destination for capital that has not performed well for some time. Um, it's probably worth looking at uh, where we are in terms of globalization. And it's nothing new. Uh, the slowdown in globalization was really marked, uh, the top of it was marked by the global financial crisis. And uh, it was uh, played out uh, politically with the election of Trump and with Brexit. And they, those, th those events uh, reflected the change in the world. So clearly having a slowdown in globalization is not great for, and, and the consequent uh, slowdown in the rate of growth in trade is not great for, for uh, world, the world economy. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, as we'll explore a little bit more later, uh, a lot of the markets, particularly China, ha have now become much more driven by domestic demand. And what we're attempting to do is find companies in that context which can continue to do well in, in their domestic market. The, the other thing that's worth pointing out is technology, a bit like coronavirus, does not respect borders. And uh, the recent rapid adoption of home office, home shopping, home, home gym have proven that technology and techno technological systems <coughs> offset to a degree the slowdown in global trade uh, that, that we've, we've experienced recently. Perhaps um, the most important aspect to look at uh, uh, when we're examining the underperformance of emerging markets is the US and currencies. And you can see here that over a, a long period, effectively since the global financial crisis, MSCI US has massively outperformed not just emerging markets, but also MSCI Europe and MSCI Japan. So emerging markets are not singular in their underperformance. What is singular and unusual is the strength of the US market uh, for various reasons, including growth, productivity, uh, technology, but in particular, in terms of currency. And this chart illustrates how the US dollar has consistently outperformed all other currencies uh, in the world. So the green line is the US dollar trade weighted index. And you can see that basically from 2013, 14 onwards, there was a dramatic shift up in terms of the value of the dollar. The gray line is the non-US uh, dollar G10, so stripping out the US from that. And you can see that, as well as EM currencies, excluding Argentina and Turkey, which would make the purple line look significantly worse, uh, have both underperformed the US dollar. So it's very, this story is very much about US dollar strength. And it's encouraging that in the last one and a half to two months, we have seen quite a change in the dollar and, <clears throat> and the dollar rate relative to, relative to other emerging markets. If we look at slide 12, um, uh, as I've said for some time, it's in disorganized democracies with poor health systems uh, where coronavirus is happy and tends to thrive. Now, unfortunately, I'm in the United States in this category. And clearly, a lot of those countries are big population nations, and therefore the, uh, the actual number of deaths is gonna be higher than smaller population countries, but China is not there. And um, so the US has a poor health system, uh, Brazil and Mexico, both and as well, and India, all have poor health systems and they're disorganized democracies. So unlike China, where uh, autocracy uh, and a surveillance state uh, has enabled them to rapidly bring coronavirus uh, and the deaths associated with it under control. This has proven much harder in more democratic countries uh, who have uh, a less intrusive state and which, which have poor health systems. 
So we can look at that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and you can see that in China, the rate of growth in new COVID-19 cases has declined rapidly. What I think is also instructive on this chart is that Korea, uh, which is a democracy, but also has a high level of technological penetration and use that early on during the outbreak of the virus uh, to help control it, has had a much better experience than some of the other nations we've talked about already, uh, US, uh, and uh, we can look at most of Europe, including the UK, uh, which have all had a pretty bad experience. And that is through a poor usage of technology in order to, in order to assess and control the outbreak of coronavirus. What's life in China like at the moment? We have clearly seen a pickup in production. Uh, if you look at most of the economic statistics, if you look at migrant workers returning to, to cities, uh, Chinese production has resumed and in many cases is at pre-coronavirus levels. However, what is not resumed at the same pace, and we can see this in a picture on the right-hand side of Starbucks, is consumption. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side of that right-hand picture, you will see a, a, uh, a, a little chart where people have to go, or a flag where people have to go and use the barcode to put on their order, and then they stand back to have their coffee and muffins uh, given to them. Um, that is a very different picture than production, and uh, we are clearly seeing a slower pickup in consumption than we are in production. And on the next slide, you can see uh, various uh, industries described, which show that in most cases, production is getting close to pre-coronavirus levels. So on the left-hand side in the red, it's where levels were. And on the right-hand side in the green, it's where levels are at the moment. And it's across a range of different industries, be it auto, consumption, tech, property, uh, industry, basic materials, we're seeing activity in China picking up uh, significantly from the coronavirus levels which, which they achieved. Um, if we take a step back to uh, a, a broader economic picture, you can see that um, China has, has actually been rebalancing its economy away from exports for quite some time. Uh, the entry of China into the WTO uh, in 2002, uh, you can see reflected on the left-hand chart with the green tops to those bars uh, with a pickup in their exports. And that drove the Chinese economic model for a period of time. We then had the global financial crisis, and you can see that exports became ne negative. And this led, led to a shift in the Chinese uh, uh, economic model with a much greater emphasis on investment. And uh, China spent a lot of money post-2009 all the way up to 2015 on building new roads, airports, etc., upgrading the infrastructure. But the big theme throughout all of this period is the blue, the blue part of those bar charts. And you can see that consumption has remained consistently strong and as a percentage of the overall contribution to real GDP growth, consumption has significantly increased and is now by far uh, the largest percentage. And this is really where the story in China lies, is in the growth of consumption and uh, income and how Chinese people are going to be spending their money. Uh, and it's instructive that increasingly that has moved away from low value added products uh, and to more value added products like insurance, uh, technology, etc. And the Chinese, as we can see on the right hand chart, have the money to spend. Disposable household income has been on a steady rise. Uh, consumption plus housing purchase, uh, which is the purple line in the middle, has been significantly increasing. So there is no shortage of money at the household level in China to spend on goods and continue to reorientate the economy to 
that of one of domestic consumption. There are some positive trends in emerging markets. And I'm going to begin on slide 18 talking about the recent monetary and fiscal policies. On the left hand side, you have uh, the Central Bank of China. They have ample room to loosen monetarily with the decline in inflation globally and the decline in inflation domestically. That room remains. Uh, and you can see that the uh, top line, which is the uh, RRR, that has been coming down consistently and it will continue to come down. If we look at the right hand side, uh, you can you can see that considering the situation in China, they've had less need to loosen fiscally in the way that some other emerging market countries uh, have done. In fact, pre-coronavirus, China had been loosening fiscally anyway because they had had a poor period of economic performance and things like tax breaks, incentives, etc. They'd been applying those for quite some time. So fiscal loosening was an ongoing, an ongoing aspect of the Chinese economy uh, as it was. What's interesting is the fiscal measures in some of the other emerging market countries, uh, and we can see Brazil uh, has significantly expanded its fiscal spending. Clearly the hope considering Brazil's historic problems with managing their fiscal accounts is that they will rein that in once the virus has spent its course. The same applies to South Africa, a country which recently lost its investment grade rating uh, and clearly does not have a lot of long-term sustainable scope to expand fiscal spending. Korea and Malaysia uh, are in a much better situation. They have strong fiscal balances, uh, very strong credit ratings, particularly Korea, and they can afford to continue with uh, fiscal easing measures for some time. Interestingly, over at the right-hand side of this bar chart, you have India. Uh, <clears throat> it looks like they are not spending a lot. Subsequent to the production of this chart in April, um, uh, India has announced a 10% of GDP fisc fiscal expansion. Some of that is double counting, uh, so it's not as large as it seems. Nevertheless, India would be over on the left-hand side of this chart were we to take into account uh, the more recent announcements the government has, has come out with. The following chart is just backing up the point I mentioned earlier in terms of currencies. And on the left-hand side, you can see that GEM currency valuation, excluding China versus the US on a purchasing power parity basis, and that is the, that is the green line, has seen a consistent weakening since 2010, 2011, i.e. US dollar strength. Uh, has led to weakness in emerging market currencies. That is partly one of the reasons, and again, this is excluding China, why GEM export market share has been increasing. And this is one of the really exciting and encouraging stories for emerging markets is one, exports, and two, greater integration into the global economy. And you can see back in 98, exports were under 10%, or sorry, GEM, percentage of global exports was under 10%, it's now over 14%. That is quite an improvement. Um, on the right hand side, you can see emerging market currency, emerging markets balance of payments, and they are in a strong surplus. And what's particularly encouraging is FDI being a major part of this. And to have a consistent and large FDI flowing into emerging markets, an FDI has to take a long-term view, it's the nature of FDI, is an extremely encouraging sign of the confidence that global investors have at a ground roots level, I'm not talking about stock market, at a ground roots level of the, of the, uh, the opportunities represented uh, within emerging markets. The other exciting aspect of emerging markets is the uh, scale of debt to GDP uh, compared to the developed world. On the left hand side, you can see that the developed world debt to GDP is over 120%. This is government debt. Emerging markets, excluding China, are one third of that at about 50%. Uh, 
Um, China itself is clearly a, a different story. Debt to GDP in China is 260%, and that's extremely high. Uh, most of that money is effectively owed to itself, being a closed finan uh, an effectively closed financial system. Um, the public debt figures are important when we look at the right-hand chart because it means the public sector has a capacity to offset the higher levels in, in private debt. Now, with the low level of interest rates, it is not a bad time to take on debt, uh, and particularly for emerging market companies that might need capital to fund their expansion. Um, but to have that uh, backstop of public debt being low, which can offset private debt, is an extremely encouraging theme when one's looking at emerging markets as an investment opportunity. So I think the themes in emerging markets uh, remain powerful and they're played out in lots of different ways uh, as people get wealthier, such as insurance, uh, getting a car, uh, particularly education, healthcare, and increasingly uh, you see people from emerging markets traveling, shopping more, and spending more money on entertainment. They have more disposable income compared to historically. The other exciting aspect uh, you can see is uh, the increase in R&D and the bubble chart on the left is illustrating this. Clearly, and the biggest bubble is the US bubble lower down on the chart, the big light blue bubble. The US uh, has the largest R&D ratio to GDP. Um, however, the exciting aspect is China, uh, which is the uh, orangey bubble uh, sort of in the middle of the chart. Uh, and uh, it's a smaller bubble, but it's the rate of growth of that bubble has been significantly more when you look at the uh, vertical axis, which shows the five-year combined rate of growth. China is just under 15%, the US is just under five percent. Um, so it's it's um, at this rate, China is going to uh, overtake the U.S. Uh, in the space of, of five years, uh, and um, it, it's it's one of the encouraging aspects as emerging markets and China in particular move up the the, the value added scale. And this is not just about uh, Huawei. Five years ago, Huawei was an important part of this, but now there is a range of companies, such as those who uh, are small suppliers for Apple phones, some of them are now better than the Taiwanese. Um, SMIC, the semiconductor company in China, is gaining on TSMC, which still remains the dominant player and based out of Taiwan. Um, so it's, it's a very encouraging and long-term development, which along with the FDI, is something that uh, encourages me when, when it comes to investing in emerging markets. The other interesting aspect is the scale of e-commerce penetration as a percentage of retail sales. And you can see that China is significantly ahead of anyone else, be it developed or emerging world. South Korea is important. And we're beginning to see countries like Brazil, India, Mexico, pick up. Now, these charts were as of the 21st November 2019, and this would have changed a lot since then with COVID-19, and you'd have seen a much larger uh, percentage of retail sales via e-commerce uh, than you would have before, including in China, but also including in, in, developed, in developed world countries. Another exciting aspect are patent developments. Uh, and uh, these are figures compiled by the US Patent Office uh, in early 2020. You can see that China has now overtaken New York State, uh, Samsung, TSMC in Germany as having the largest count of patents. Um, uh, this is a per annum total. I think what's also encouraging about this is you see individual companies, not countries, like Samsung Electronics, and TSMC registered on this chart, and uh, really not far off Germany in some cases. So um, I think uh, as a reflection of R&D and a reflection of innovation, uh, this is an, uh, an illustrative chart of where market, uh, emerging markets are and where they will be going, because 
these patents obviously transfer or some of them into technology, into development, into R&D. If we look at emerging markets from a valuation perspective, you can see that the bubble uh, long ago left emerging markets and went to the developed world and particularly the US. What I've chosen here are uh, the Schiller PE ratio. Uh, so we're looking at the 10 year inflation adjusted PE ratio. Uh, and you can see that the US uh, has seen significant valuation expansion to 29 times, whereas GEM have come down an awful lot from the peaks they achieved in the uh, mid to late uh, 2000s, and we're trading at around 10.9 times. I, I take that as a very encouraging uh, argument uh, uh, to have a cheap valuation, particularly relative to the largest developed market uh, in the world. CAPE ratios are similar to to, uh, to Schiller ratios, but I've used this to illustrate where some of the bubbles lie. And you can see again in the middle of uh, that chart on the right-hand side, emerging markets uh, at the bottom end of their range, whereas US large and US small in particular are looking pretty expensive. We can look at this from a price book value ratio perspective. Uh, the price book value has come off significantly uh, recently. Uh, and the, this is data as of the 20th of March, so it would have come off even more since then. Um, and that is another reason why emerging markets are cheap. The right-hand chart, I apologize, it's slightly mislabeled. It should be uh, relative price book, not relative PE. But again, you can see on a standard deviation basis, emerging markets uh, price book value relative to developed markets price book value is at all time lows. What to look for uh, on slide 28. Uh, and these are some of the themes that we uh, see in emerging markets and where we see growth playing out and where we expect growth to continue to play out. One is middle class expansion in terms of numbers, in terms of wealth, and they're gonna spend their money on new and exciting things. They're gonna spend it on uh, uh, improved dairy products. So the first symbol you see to the left of San Lam is Yili, Inner Mongolia, Yili, a dairy company. They have 22% market share in China. And what we're seeing is uh, people want more and more of their premium products like yogurts, like flavored milks. Um, so people begin to go up the value chain uh, in terms of particular products they might consume. Sanlam is not only a South African, but a Trans-Africa insurance company. And this theme of people wanting to protect what they have to ensure their homes, uh, to take out health care, um, uh, and to save money, because in many cases, insurance companies are savings products as well. Um, we see that uh, being played out uh, across even less developed emerging markets like South Africa, and Sanlam is, is, is a leading provider of those services for Africans. Uh, Hengan uh, is a tissue company, uh, and again, uh, and diapers, uh, feminine products. So as people have more money, again, they move up that scale and so forth. Um, if we look at infrastructure, most uh, data that you can look at will show that excluding uh, seaboard China, Korea, Taiwan, and specific other spots in emerging markets, infrastructure is massively needed in nearly all emerging markets. And there are ways to play that via the stock market. Power Grid Corporation of India, they have 55% of the transmission market in India. Uh, for electricity, uh, there is a huge demand for electricity in India as the economy grows at a, at a decent rate of five to seven percent. Telecom Indonesia, um, broadband penetration is only five percent in Indonesia. This is a, an organization that has 65 percent of the mobile market backed by the government. CCR, roads in Brazil, uh, again, uh, the, the, if you look at data on terms of paved roads or usable roads in Brazil, it's extremely low. The government can't afford to 
to develop these roads. So they outsource uh, concessions to the private sector and CCR is, is the leading domestic player in terms of providing that service. In over in Mexico, gas, uh, again, uh, a basic product, but uh, replacing oil and uh, increased penetration throughout Mexico. We've touched on the theme of innovation earlier, but just to mention some companies that are innovating and are leading innovators, even compared to the developed world, Ping An, which is a Chinese insurance company, they are selling uh, Discover, uh, Discovery, which is a South African company, they're selling their Vitality product, whereby people can offset doing more exercise, being more healthy with lower insurance premiums. NetEase is a gaming company in China. Their product is so good um, that it's not restricted to Chinese characters and uh, Chinese culture, and they are expecting within five years to be exporting between 30 and 40 percent, or sorry, between 30 and 40 percent of their income to be from 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 exports. Um, Samsung Electronics on the far right there. I mean, as as seen earlier in in the in the uh, patent chart. Samsung is is a clear leader in innovation. Um, when I was younger, Samsung was regarded as a pretty low quality product company. It's now a brand name uh, and their product is highly regarded in not just emerging, but in the developed world. Where are Chinese consumers spending their money? Well, you can see the big change between 2015 and 2018, healthcare being the largest of those changes, but also housing and education. Uh, what is uh, not consuming as much of their income are the more basic things, which is reflective of having higher levels of income. So clothing, food and tobacco take up less spending than, than, they, than they historically used to. Um, they, have, they spend a lot on healthcare in terms of uh, out-of-pocket healthcare spending. That is coming down as efficiencies take place. And we would expect in time that to be uh, at a similar level to the developed countries that you can see on the right-hand side of the right-hand chart. I, I wanna to touch on one stock to illustrate uh, what can happen even in difficult emerging markets like Brazil, which suffered the worst recession for 100 years between 2014 and 2017. Uh, Localiza is a car rental company. Uh, they, are the they have the largest network throughout Brazil um, and they have 30% of all car rental. And I'm including fleet cars as well as individual car rentals, which you or I might, might, might use. Um, they have gained massive market share and increased earnings despite the recession that Brazil had. So you can see that from 2016 to 19, they almost doubled uh, their EPS um, and their market share from 2015 to 2019 went from 20% to 51% in individual car rental. They've tied up with Uber, they introduced uh, uh, a technological solution to Uber, which suited Uber, suited them, uh, reduced uh, non-payment issues. Um, and by the way, uh, Brazil is Uber's largest market in the world, including the US. This is a company that is excellent in having the right car at the right place, at the right price, uh, uh, where, wherever it might be in Brazil. Uh, and they have focused on uh, a singular activity uh, the management is extremely dedicated. They've spent money on technology. Um, so it's illustrative of a fact that even in markets which might be suffering recessions, you can still find very strong investment opportunities. So to conclude, on page 32, there are always two sides to a story. There are always dangers, but there are always opportunities. And that is what we're paid to try to uh, look through and take advantage of. The global economy right now is contracting, but at the same time, China and North Asia are recovering fast. Uh, although clearly if you have a second wave of pandemic, um, uh, we could see some regression in this. The markets are saying they're expecting a V-shaped recovery at the moment. And that is why stocks have been so strong and almost all the losses uh, uh, suffered 
during the coronavirus uh, problems of the last few months have been recovered in markets like the US uh, and China. The visibility is low. That is often the case in emerging markets um, and uh, we're paid clearly to analyze risk and reduce it, but existing trends are accelerating. For instance, I mentioned online spending was up 10% year on year uh, in China in March. Inflation could increase. Uh, signs are when you look at the uh, US 10 year treasury uh, that inflation is likely to pick up. Perhaps we've had overstimulus. Um, that would be good for markets, but bad for economies long term. But then again, uh, inflation at the moment uh, has hit a 30 year low in 2019 and taking into account where inflation rates are, there's probably a bit more room for stimulus in emerging markets. The dollar is strong. That's not good for emerging markets, but we're beginning to see signs that that might be changing. And it's clear that virtually all other emerging markets, all other emerging currencies are extremely undervalued. The end of globalization is, is not good. It is a danger. But the increased emphasis on domestic sectors, companies orientated uh, to their domestic markets uh, offers a lot of opportunities. If we look at emerging markets in a broader sense, you can see that as, uh, as a percentage of MSCI all country world, emerging markets are only 11%. And yet they're 87% of the global population. That seems a bit of a mismatch to me. And if we look at it from a global stock market capitalization perspective, emerging markets are 25% and yet they're 43% of global GDP. So part of the story for emerging markets, which is encouraging, is the integration of emerging markets and the fact that over time they will represent a greater, a greater part of global stock market capitalization. So I think emerging markets have, have come a long way, particularly compared to the 50s. And we have a little uh, picture here of what a father would have said to their child in the 50s, which is eat up all your food because children are starving in China and India. And now because of the level of education, the competition, the integration of two very large workforces into the global economy, uh, we're seeing parents saying to their children, you better study hard because the competition is fierce if you want to get a job. So that concludes the presentation. Uh, I hope you found it of interest and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas.